are common today and is affecting every area of our society. The sitcoms that are being made, the movies that are being produced, the music that is being played, the videos that our kids are watching, the violent video games that our kids are playing, rapid crime in our cities and neighborhoods, drug abuse, alcohol abuse, sex abuse, adultery, fornication, child molestation, abortion, homosexuality, same-sex marriage, racism, pornography, and gang violence are common occurrences in our nation, are common occurrences in our country, are common occurrences in our cities. So the question, Southern Baptist, of the hour is, how do we address these issues that are affecting our nations? How do we handle these issues, Barry, that are affecting our country? How do we confront these issues that are affecting our cities? Well, my brother, Brothers and my sisters, y'all ask some very good questions here. That kind of frees me up to give you the answer. Southern Baptists, I am convinced that if things are going to change in America, Franklin Avenue, I am convinced that if things are going to change in your state, in my state, in your city, in my city, if things are going to change in our nation, ladies and gentlemen, there must be, there must be, there must be a spiritual awakening in America. There must be a spiritual revival in our nation. And there must be a spiritual revival that starts in the church. Now notice I said, that if the spiritual awakening, that if the spiritual revival, that as a spiritual renewal is gonna happen, it must start in your church and my church. Not in Congress, in the church. Not in the Senate, in the church. Not in the White House, in the church. Not in your house or in my house. If spiritual renewal and revival, ladies and gentlemen, are gonna take place, it must start in the church. It must start with the people of God. It must start, I repeat, it must start, also it must start with prayer. Brothers and sisters, if there is any hope for spiritual revival in America, if there's any hope for spiritual renewal in America, that renewal must start in our churches and it must start with the people in our churches, Christians, believers, and the body of Christ. Ladies and gentlemen of the Southern Baptist Convention, we have a great and glorious opportunity to turn around the downward spiritual trend of our nation if we would just take seriously the great commission that has been given to us as the church. If the church is gonna accept the, cha the challenge, the mandate, we must bathe this effort in prayer. That's what Israel did in Psalms 80. And that's what the church and this convention must do. Spiritual awakening and spiritual revival must start in the church and it must start with prayer. I'm gonna say that again. Spiritual awakening and spiritual revival and renewal must start in the church and it must start in prayer. Prayer for the believer is how we communicate with God. Prayer is how we talk to God. I'm not talking to you, you're not talking to me, we're talking to God. There's a pastor friend of mine who tells an amusing story about the time he was teaching his little daughter how to pray. He would go to her room, he can't every night. He would uh, get on his knees, she would get on her knees. He put his hands together, she put her hands together. He said, and he'd lead her into the Lord's prayer. Our Father which art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. And she would repeat after him then the prayer that many of us as uh, parents have taught our kids. Now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep and so on. He did this for about a week, Barry. And after about a week, he came to his daughter's room and he said, baby, I've been teaching you this prayer for about a week. You think you can do it? She said, yes, daddy, I know I can do it. Say, so you sure you can do it? Say, yes, daddy, I'm sure I can do it. Say, so you sure you can lead the prayer? She looked at him and said, yes, daddy, I'm sure I can lead the prayer. He said, okay, let's pray. He got on his knees, she got on her knees. He put his hands together, she put her hands together. He bowed his head, she bowed her head. There was about, uh, some silence after about 30 seconds. Didn't hear anything, kind of looked at him. She was in the right position, had her hands folded, her head bowed. 
after about 45 seconds, still nothing. After about a minute, about, boy, he couldn't take it anymore. And he looked at her and said, baby, you okay? She said, yes, daddy, I'm fine. Say, you can do this? Say, yes, daddy, I can do this. Say, you sure you can lead the prayer? Yes, daddy, I can lead the prayer. And he said, but baby, daddy can't hear you. And there's a typical four-year-old who's been here before. She put her hands on her hip, looked at her daddy and said, I ain't talking to you. Isn't that good? Prayer is how we communicate with God. We're talking to God. It's a form of communication that every member, that every member of the body of Christ should take advantage of. As a matter of fact, the Bible encourages this form of communication between God and his sons and daughters. In Matthew 6 and 9, Jesus taught his disciples how to pray. Matthew 7 and 7, ask and it shall be given. Seek and you shall find. Knock and the door shall be opened unto you. Matthew 21 and 22, and all things with itself you shall ask in prayer believing you shall receive Matthew 26 and 41 watch and pray that you enter not into temptation brother Dan Luke chapter 18 and verse 1 that men should always pray and not faint first Thessalonians 5 and 17 pray without ceasing and my favorite scripture on prayer Philippians chapter 4 and verse 6 be careful for nothing don't worry about anything but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving let your request be made known unto God and the peace of God. The peace of God which passes all understanding shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus our Lord. And finally, as it relates to prayer, uh, making a difference in our nation, in our society, in our state, in our cities, we must mention 2 Chronicles chapter 7 and verse 14. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray, humble themselves and pray, humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven. I'll forgive their sin and I'll heal, I'll heal, I'll heal their land. Oh, brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen, a spiritual renewal, a spiritual revival will take place, Brother John, says Sharon, in our nation. It must start with the church calling on God in prayer. Amen. That's what happened here in Psalms 80. When Israel prayed to God for restoration, when Israel prayed to God for revival, and that's what must happen in the Southern Baptist Convention. Brothers and sisters, we must do all that we can to call on God in prayer so that God can bring about renewal and restoration to our churches in America. So what happens when we call on God in prayer? What happens when we call on God on behalf of our nation, on behalf of our states? What happens when we call on God on behalf of our churches? Well, brothers and sisters, I truly believe that God will send revival. I truly believe that God will send revival. However, for God to send revival and renew in our churches and convention, I believe there's something that must happen first. First of all, number one, if God is going to send renewal, if God is going to send revival to our churches in America, number one, there must be repentance. Amen. There must be repentance. Look at verse 14 in Psalms 80. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. L ladies and gentlemen, there must be repentance. Brothers and sisters, we as a convention, we as pastors, we as churches must ask God's forgiveness for not making evangelism a priority in our churches and in our nation. We must ask God's forgiveness for not making reaching lost people a priority. Have you heard the latest baptism numbers are reported by our baptism task force through NAM? 25% of our churches reported no baptisms. 60% of our churches reported no baptisms for young people between the ages of 12 and 17. 80%, I repeat, 80% of our churches in the Southern Baptist Convention 
baptized only one person between the ages of 18 and 29. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, it's no wonder why our numbers are falling. It's no wonder why our baptism numbers are falling. It's no wonder why our attendance numbers and our membership numbers and our youth numbers are falling. Ladies and gentlemen, if we were working a secular job with these kind of reports, many of us would have been fired a long time ago. We must, we must, we must repent. We must ask God for forgiveness. We must tell God we're sorry. Ladies and gentlemen, the reason is because we have the answer for a sin-sick world. We have the answer for a sin-sick society. We have the answer for an anything goes society. We have the answer for those who are living in America today. And the answer is we must share with this lost world the gospel of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, because only only the gospel can transform a person's life. That's why Paul said in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone can that believes, uh, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Ladies and gentlemen, I believe that some of us have been saved for so long, we forgot how much, there, how much power there is in the gospel to transform lives. I believe that some of us have just been going through the motions for so long that we forgot that the gospel can transform life. Think about it. You haven't always been saved. You haven't always been born again. You haven't always been a believer. Think about it. Before you are who you are tonight, before you are who you are tonight, what did it take to change you? Before you were preaching the gospel, before you are a pastor, before you are singing gospel music, what did it take to change you? Before you are a Sunday school teacher, before you are a seminary president, before you are a seminary professor, what did it take to change you? Before you are an evangelist, before you are a missionary, before you are a denominational worker, what did it take to change you? Before you work for IMB, or for NAM, or for Lifeway, what did it take to change you? Before you work for Guy Stoner, a WMU, or for the Southern Baptist Convention, what did it take to change you? And in other words, my brothers and my sisters, in your BC days, in your before Christ days, uh, what did it take to change you? In other words, before you were bought or uh, given your first King James Schofield reference Bible, how many of y'all remember called King James Schofield? What did it take to change you? The question of the hour, my brothers and my sisters, what did it take to change you? Well, my friend, let me answer my own question. You and I were changed when we heard the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Amen. We were changed, we were born again. We heard the good news of the gospel and the gospel changed your life and your life and your life and your life and the gospel changed my life. That same gospel, my brothers and my sisters, that same gospel can change the lives of lost men, women, boys and girls in our cities, in our towns, in our nation, in America. So brothers and sisters, Ladies and gentlemen, let me encourage you pastors to preach the gospel. Let me encourage Sunday school teachers, teach the gospel. Let me encourage Bible study teachers, teach the gospel. Let me encourage seminary professors, teach the gospel. Let me encourage evangelists, preach the gospel. Let me encourage every church of the Southern Baptist Convention to take the word of God, stand flat footed and preach the word of God. In order to reach this iPod, iPad, iPhone generation, in order to reach this sin sick society, in order to reach the lost and dying world that we're living in, we must, we must give them the Word of God. Not any gimmicks, the Word of God. Not any games, the Word of God. Give the lost the Word of God. Give this dying world the Word of God. Give them the gospel of Jesus Christ. Oh, brothers and sisters, God, we need to tell God, God, we repent for using substitutes for the Word of God. But then there's a second thing in the text. If revival is gonna happen, 
in America is viable going to happen and renewal is going to happen. In our states, our towns, our cities, our churches, and our convention, not only must we repent, but Chip secondly, there must be remorse. Not only must there be repentance, Mac also there must be remorse. Look at the first part of verse 18 in Psalms 80. The psalmist said, then we will not turn back from you. When there's repentance and there's remorse, the psalmist said, then we will not turn back from you. Listen to the psalmist cry after repenting. Listen to the psalmist cry after asking God forgiveness. Verse 18a, he said, Lord, then we will not turn back from you. Repentance means to turn away from bad actions. Remorse means a sense of guilt for one's action. Let me say that again. Repentance means to turn away from bad actions. Remorse means a sense of guilt for one's action. Brothers and sisters, if renewal is going to happen in the Southern Baptist Convention, if renewal is going to happen in your church, in my church, in your town, in my town, we must have a sense of remorse. We must have a sense of guilt. We must have a sense of regret for not being obedient to the great commission by our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. In the great commission, Jesus told us, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, in the name of the Son, and in the name of the Holy Spirit. That's what Jesus' church told us to do. That's what Jesus commissioned us to do. However, according to our baptism numbers, a lot of churches are not going. According to our attendance numbers, a lot of our churches are not making disciples. How else can we explain the numbers across our convention? How else can we explain the numbers across our churches? Listen, brothers and sisters, we're living in a day and time where there is no commitment to the church anymore. That we're living in a day and time where there's no allegiance to a denomination anymore. There was a time, and those of you who are 50 years over like me, you can remember, there was a time when you just opened the church door and people would come from the neighborhood. There was a time you just opened the church door and people would come from different families. There was a time when you just opened the church door and people were expected to go to church. Many of you grew up, Pastor Ken Weathersby like me, who many of us did not have a choice where we were going to church on Sunday morning. How many of y'all remember that? Many of us in here, I see all those hands, Many of us who are 50 years older, we do not have a choice of whether or not we're going to church on Sunday morning. Elizabeth, I can vividly remember. Yolanda, I can vividly remember my sisters here. My mama telling us, boy, as long as you're living under my roof, boy, as long as you're eating my food, boy, as long as you're sleeping in my bed, boy, as long as you're drinking my water, on Sunday morning, everybody in this house is going to church. Everybody who in this house is going to church. As a matter of fact, Southern Baptist, I tell people all across America that my mom, that, that pastor, uh, Dr. Ballard, gave me my first drug problem. She drug me to church and, and drug me to Sunday school and brought she drug me to VBS. Amen. But ladies and gentlemen, sadly, those days are over. Kelly, sadly, those days are over. Parents are not coming to church. Parents are not coming to church. In some cases, grandparents are not coming to church. So if, if Papa and Mama is not coming, if the parents are not coming, therefore their children are not coming to church. Therefore the teenagers are not coming to church. Therefore there are no salvation decisions and there's no baptisms in the churches because nobody is coming. So if they are not coming to us, we must, we must, we must go to them. That's what Jesus meant when he gave us the Great Commission. Jesus told us, go, don't stay. Go, don't think about it. Go, don't debate it. Go, don't study it. Go, don't blog about it. Go, go, go and make disciples. Ladies and gentlemen, if you are born again, if you are saved, if you are a Christian, if you're a believer, if you are a child of God, if you have been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb, well, guess what? You qualify. Go, 
go, go, go, go and make disciples of all nations, every tongue, every tribe, every nation, every neighborhood, every race, and every culture. No matter who they are, no matter where they're from, no matter what their situation may be, go and make disciples. They may speak English, Spanish, French, or German. Go and make disciples. They may live uptown, downtown, your town, or my town. Go and make disciples. They may be Jew, Gentile, Muslim, or Hindu. Go and make disciples. No matter their hairstyle, they can have an afro, dreadlocks, a comb over, a bald head. Go! and make disciples. No matter how they dress, shorts, jeans, t-shirt, or baggy pants, go and make disciples. No matter what they have on their feet, Jordans, Converse, Nikes, or Reeboks, or slippers, go and make disciples. No matter what their body looks like, they may have tattoos, earrings, or body piercings, go and make disciples. No matter what their style of music may be, it could be hip hop, gangster rap, Rock and roll, R&B, or even country and western. <laughs> go, go, go and make disciples. Oh God, please forgive us for not being obedient to the Great Commission. Oh God, please forgive us for not being obedient and sharing the good news of the gospel to those in our neighborhood, to those in our community, to those in our city, to those who are in need of a savior. Oh God, we repent. Oh God, we are remorseful. Therefore we cry out like the Israelites here in Psalms 80 and verses 14 and verse 18. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Look down from heaven and see. And then here in verse 18, then we will uh, not back away from you. Return, we beseech you, O God of hosts. Then we will not turn back from you. But then, ladies and gentlemen, there's one more point to this message tonight. Brothers and sisters as of the Southern Baptist Convention, if we expect to do something about the spiritual decline across our convention, if we expect to do something about the spiritual awakening across our convention, if we expect to emphasize the importance, Brother Milton, of evangelism, if we expect to make a priority of making disciples, if we expect as Southern Baptists to bring restoration and renewal through prayer, number one, there must be repentance. Number two, there must be remorse. And brothers and sisters, if we as a convention do number one and do number two, I promise you, the third thing will happen. And the third thing is, there will, there will, there will be revival. There will be revival. Listen to the text again in verse 18 and verse part of verse 19. Then we will not turn back from you. Here it is, revive us and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O God of hosts. Cause your face to shine upon us. Listen to the children of Israel, Barry, realizing their faults. Listen to the children of Israel after realizing their mistakes. He said, revive us and we will call upon your name. Restore us, O Lord God of hosts. Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, after there was repentance, after there was remorse, then they cried out to God for revival. In like manner, brothers and sisters of the Southern Baptist Convention, we can no longer ignore these reports every year. We can no longer ignore these numbers every year. For another year, our baptism numbers are down. For another year, our attendance is down. For another year, our youth numbers are down. Brothers and sisters, we are losing a generation. We are losing a generation. Southern Baptist Convention, we can no longer be at ease in Zion while people all around us, boy, are dying and going to hell. Right. Therefore, right. we must repent. Therefore, Marvin, we must have remorse and we must do what Israel did in Psalms 80. The Bible says, the scripture says, the word of God says, they prayed to God for restoration. They prayed to God for revival. 
Ladies and gentlemen, brothers and sisters, as your president the past two years, Augie, that has been my heart's desire. As your president for the last two years, my heart's desire has been that God would make us one and that God would send revival and renew through the churches of the Southern Baptist Convention. Brothers and sisters, the only way that will happen in this nation, the only way that will happen in this convention, the only way that would happen in our churches is if the people of God cry out to God in prayer. If there is genuine repentance, if there is genuine remorse, and if we call on the name which is above every name, that name uh, which is above every name, that name which is above the name uh, of the Republicans, that name which is above the name uh, of the Democrats, that name which is above the name uh, of Congress, that name which is above every name uh, of the U.S. Senate, that name is above every name uh, of those riding a donkey or those riding an elephant. Oh, ladies and gentlemen, we need to call uh, on that name. Uh, I wonder tonight if you know his name, uh, that name uh, that can change the heart of a racist, that name that can change the mind of a murderer, that name that can change the desire of a child molester. Oh, I wonder if you know his name, that name that can change the crowd of a gang member, that name that can change the habit of a prostitute, that name that can change the desire of a drug addict. Oh, I wonder tonight, Southern Baptist, if you know his name, that name that can change the taste buds of an alcoholic, that name that can change the heart of a hypocrite. That name that can change the lifestyle of a homosexual. Oh, I wonder if you know that name. Uh, that name that can change the actions of an adulterer. That name that can change the thoughts of a thief. That name that can change the desire of a lost sinner. Oh, Southern Baptist, I wonder if you know his name. Uh, Jehovah Jireh, Jehovah Nisi, Jehovah Shalom, uh, Jehovah Tuskenu. I wonder, Southern Baptist, if you know uh, his name, uh, the Alpha and the Advocate. The Almighty and the Amen. The often finisher of our faith. The captain of our salvation. The chief shepherd. Oh, I wonder if you know his name. Uh, the door, the cornerstone, uh, the commander, the creator, the faithful witness, the good shepherd, the great high priest. Uh, oh, I wonder if you know uh, his name. Uh, the head of the church, uh, the holy child. Uh, the I am uh, that I am. Uh, the Emmanuel, Jehovah, King of the ages, the lawgiver, the Lamb of God. Uh, oh, Southern Baptist, I wonder if you know uh, his name, uh, the light of the world, uh, the Lion of Judah, the Lord of all, the Son of God, uh, and the Son of Man, uh, the resurrection and the life, uh, the true life. Oh, Southern Baptist, I wonder if you know his name, uh, the Lord of glory, the mighty God, uh, the Messiah, the Lord of righteousness, the rock, the bright and morning star, the Prince of Peace. Oh, Southern Baptist, uh, I wonder if you know his name. Uh, the the Redeemer, the true light, uh, the true vine, uh, the way, the truth, uh, and the life, uh, the rose of Sharon, the everlasting Father, the Deliverer, the just one, uh, the Word of God. I wonder if you know his name, uh, the man of sorrow, the beginning and the first and the last, uh, the beginning and the end, uh, the Alpha and the Omega, the King of Kings, uh, and the Lord of Lords. I wonder, Southern Baptist, do you know his name? That name, that name, that name, that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, that at the name of Jesus, every knee must bow and every tongue must confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Oh, Southern Baptist, I heard the joy bell sound. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. I'm gonna tell it all around. Jesus saves, Jesus saves. To the utmost, Jesus saves. From the utmost, Jesus saves. He'll pick you up yeah. and he'll turn you around. Somebody know what I'm talking about, say hallelujah. Somebody know what I'm talking about, hallelujah. Somebody that's been saved, say hallelujah. Jesus saves. So come on, Southern Baptist. If God's going to send revival, there must be repentance. There must be remorse. And there must, we must call on his name. 
in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, we have the victory. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, Satan, you have to flee. Southern Baptist, tell me who can stand be for us when we call on that great name. What's his name, church? Jesus. What's his name, church? Jesus. What's his name, church? Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. We must call on the name of Jesus. Brothers and sisters, ladies and gentlemen of the Southern Baptist Convention, as I come to a close, will you repeat these words after me? Lord, send the revival. Lord, send the revival. Lord, send the revival. I point to yourself and say, let it begin with me. May God bless you. May God bless your family. May God bless your ministry. And may God bless the Southern Baptist Convention. God bless you. I love y'all. Thank y'all for letting me be here on tonight.